Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now, once again, it's time to renew our weekly visits with that genial host and incomparable storyteller, Dr. Watson. And here he is, waiting for us in his comfortable and familiar study. Hello, Dr. Watson. It's mighty good to see you again. Good evening, Mr. Bell. Good gracious me, it's a long time since you last dropped in to see me. <laughs> Too long entirely, but I'm certainly glad to be back. I'm glad to have you back, my boy. This seems like old times. Thank you, sir. By the way, I heard you had quite a trip this summer. Went back to England, didn't you? Yes, Mr. Bell, I must say I had a very delightful time renewing old friendships. Incidentally, I think you'll be particularly interested in one visit that I made. It was to the vaults of Cox's Bank in Charing Cross. Cox's Bank? Oh, that was the home of your old black tin dispatch box, wasn't it? <laughs> the one that contained all the notes on your adventures with the great Sherlock Holmes? It was, my boy. You have a very good memory. And by any chance, is that the box standing there on your table it now? It certainly is. I brought it back with me. You see, I find it contained a veritable treasure trove of material. Notes on adventures that I'd forgotten, and in some cases, stories that Sherlock Holmes insists must not be published during the lifetime of uh, certain uh, famous people involved. You, that certainly is a treasure trove. Now, do you mind if I take a peek in the sacred box, Dr. Watson? Not at all, Mr. Bell, not at all. Hmm, must be papers all tied up in tape. An old signet ring. Oh, that just a token of the Duke of Bedford's esteem. Never did fit. Hey, what's this, Dr. Watson? A small dog collar. Yes, my boy, a small dog collar. And it brings to mind one of the most exciting, bizarre adventures that Sherlock Holmes and I ever encountered. I always referred to it as the adventure... Of the stuttering ghost. Stuttering ghost? That sounds provocative, Dr. Watson. I hope you'll find it so, Mr. Bell. Now, Dr. Watson, the floor is yours. Well, Mr. Bell, the story began on a certain September afternoon in, well, more years ago than I, than I like to admit. Holmes and I were seated in our Baker Street lodgings, having returned a few hours previously from a much-needed holiday in Devonshire. Though our trip had proved far from restful as far as I was concerned... I could see that the change had worked wonders for my old friend. There was a distinct touch of color in his usually pale face, and I knew by the sparkle in his eye that he was happy to be back in harness, as he sat there skimming through the letters that had accumulated during his absence. Watson, has it ever occurred to you that the entire course of history might have been changed, probably for the better, if paper and ink had never been invented? Oh, rubbish. It's good to be back in Baker Street again, eh, Holmes? Mm, yes. Back to the routine of stupid letters from stupid people after two peaceful weeks at the seaside. Peaceful? And you spent most of your time solving the problem of the lifeguard, the calabash, and the dying nursemaid. Merely a routine matter, Watson. Though it did have its points of interest. Anything startling in this morning's post? The usual trivialities. The Duke of Greenock suspects the Duchess of planning to elope with the underfootman. Oh, knowing the Duke, I can't say that I blame her. Quite. Doesn't anyone use imagination in committing crimes anymore? Aha. Uh -huh. This looks more promising. Huh? What is it, Holmes? Hmm. I shall present my problem to you at three o'clock tomorrow afternoon. It's almost three now, and the letter's dated yesterday. It doesn't sound particularly promising to me. Who is it from? It's simply signed Ferdinand. It's very odd. Holmes, it might be royalty. Only reigning monarchs sign themselves to strangers simply by their first names. If you're referring to Ferdinand of Spain, he's dead, you know. Well, you're pulling my leg. Still, I can't recall a Ferdinand on any current European throne. Nor can I. And yet there is a certain tone of royal peremptoriness in the phrasing. Where's uh, the front doorbell? It's exactly three o'clock. That could be him now. Yes. While Mrs. Hudson answers the door, suppose we have another look at this note. Expensive paper written with a quill pen. And the presumably august scribe was unfortunate enough to get a smear of ink on the outer side of her right little finger. Why do you say her right little finger? It's a woman's writing. Oh. Come in. Yes, Mrs. Hudson? You have a visit to Mr. Holmes, and she's got a wee dog with her. She said you might be expecting her. Oh, very well, Mrs. Hudson. Show her up, please. Yes, sir. A woman and a wee dog. 
And here we are waiting for royalty. Watson, I've sometimes hmm? observed a distinctly snobbish strain in you. Hmm. Most regrettable in these democratic days. Democratic? I well, voted conservative India, all my life. Please, I always will vote conservative. Oh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, you dear, dear man. <laughs> oh, I've heard so much about you. Oh, I suppose you're wondering who I am. Naturally, madam. Sit down, won't you? May I introduce my friend, Dr. Watson? Oh, How do you do, How madam? How do you do? I'm Mrs. Frampton. Mrs. James Frampton. That's the Buckinghamshire Frampton's, you know. And I've traveled all the way up here with darling little Fursley. Oh, and he no. does hate trains, don't you, no. sweetheart? <laughs> By the way, Mrs. Frampton, would you mind telling me why you signed your note, Ferdinand? Why, Mr. Holmes, whatever makes you think I wrote your note? Among other things, the slight trace of an ink stain on your right little finger. Oh, Oh, dear. It's so simple when you explain it, isn't it? Quite. Well, since you're so clever, I did write that note. But only because Ferdinand here asked me to. What? <laughs> yes, the darling dictated it all by himself. He said... Bup, 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 and I wrote it all down <laughs> for him. Well, that's a dog-writing note. Don't you think, Mrs. Frampton, that if your dog has any problems, a veterinary surgeon would be the logical person to consult? <laughs> Oh, 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 dear, now you've upset him. He's so terribly sensitive. Dr. Watson, hmm? I wonder if you'd mind taking him out for a little walk. Who, oh, me? Yes. Hmm? I'd much rather he was out of the way when I tell Mr. Holmes about him. Hmm. He's so human, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm quite sure he understands every word I say. Oh, I oh please, Dr. Watson. Oh, really, madam, I come, don't come, think... Come, Watson. Uh, Can't you see the little fellow's dying for some air? I think a little walk would do you both oh, good. It's all very well. Oh, oh, very well. Come along, you little blight, little fellow. Come on. And now, Mrs. Frampton, may I ask what has brought you to see me? Well, Mr. Holmes, uh, two weeks ago, one of Ferdy's gold collars was stolen. And a week after that, he was sent back to me with a very strange note. You have the note with you? Uh, yes. Yes, it's here in my purse. Put your hands up, Mr. Holmes. Well. That's right. Do you mind pointing that revolver another way, Mrs. Frampton? I have no intention of pointing it another way. Furthermore, you'd be astonished at my skill in using it. Not at all. Oh? When a woman has the audacity to call on me with the outline of a revolver plainly visible through the side of her purse, I naturally assume she is able to use it. You knew I was armed, and yet you I didn't... regret to say that sometimes my curiosity overcomes my caution, and I was very curious as to the purpose of the ridiculous rules of the letter-writing dog. I still am. You'll very soon see. Go and sit in that upright chair by the desk there. Mr. Holmes... I assure you, I won't hesitate to use this revolver. Go over to that chair. Very well. Sit down in it. With your back to me. That's it. I was admiring these handcuffs on your mantelpiece. They'll do very well to fasten you to the chair. Put your hands behind you. Thank you. What's the game, Mrs. Frampton? Daylight robbery? Yes. Or murder, if you don't help me. You realize that my friend is liable to come back at any moment? <laughs> oh, no, Mr. Holmes. That beastly dog was a deliberate device to separate you and your friend. A colleague of mine will see that Dr. Watson is taken care of as soon as he gets outside. And now, Mr. Holmes, I do hope you're not going to be too difficult. <laughs> Come along, you stupid creature. You don't have to sniff every... Come on. <coughs> Playing nursemaid to pick and ease. Hope I don't run into anyone I know. Come along, you little brute. Come on. Excuse me, Governor. Yes, yes, yes. You got a match? A match? Yes, I think I have. <laughs> cool, you're an awful nice little dog, Governor. What's his name? His name? Uh... Never mind. You come here now. Why, you scoundrel, put down that piece of lead pipe. <laughs> Get out of under my feet, you nasty dog. You uh, You would, would you? Madam, if you'll just tell me what you're looking for, I'll be delighted to tell you where to find it. There's no sense in messing all my files up. I want your records of the Rothier case. In the third drawer of this cabinet. Oh. Well, here we are. N, O, P, Q, Randall. Rothier. Well, thank you, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Ah, there's the rescue party. But it can't be Dr. Watson. Alfie was to take care of him. Dr. Watson has resources that might surprise you. Sometimes they surprise even me. Well, uh, I've got what I came 
Holmes, I had the most amazing experience. Yes, I, yes, uh, you were set upon by a ruffian in the street. Phil asked for a match and then... Uh, how, how did you know? Elementary, my dear Watson. Huh? Now, please get the key off the mantelpiece and unlock these handcuffs. Good heavens. Who trusts you up like that? Mrs. Frampton, at revolver point. You see? If you hadn't made me go out with that silly little dog, she you... She would never have revealed her purpose in coming here. Watson, the whole thing was a plot to gain access to my files on the Rothier case. I say, the Rothier case? Why, that Hurry case... up with that key, will you, old chap? Yes, of course. Ah. There you are. I say, how did that woman get out? Obviously down the back stairs, as you didn't pass her on the front. I assume her accomplice got away, too. Yes, he wouldn't have if I hadn't tripped up over the dog leash. I left this little beast downstairs with Mrs. Hudson. Suppose we see if our caller took anything of any consequence. But Holmes... Why should anyone go to such fantastic lengths to steal the file on a criminal case that happened years ago? That's what we have to find out. You recall the Rothier affair, Watson? Yes, I could do. Something to do with a, a jewel robbery, was it? Yes. Rothier and his English accomplice, a gentleman known as Stuttering Steve Hacker, stole the famous Shrewsbury Emerald. Yes, 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 of course, of course. The jewels were never recovered, but I was instrumental in bringing the men to justice. I remember it now. Rothier was killed, resisting arrest, wasn't he? Yes, and stuttering Steve Hacker was sentenced to seven years in Dartmoor. By George, Watson, I recall reading a small item in yesterday's paper that told of Hacker's death in prison. That's the answer. You mean that on his deathbed, Hacker might have told someone the secret of where the jewel is hidden? Precisely. The key to that secret must lie in these files. Let me see. Yes, yes, I recall the case vividly now. Uh, there was a small piece of paper found on Rothier's body. An apparently meaningless series of numbers and figures. It was uh, here in the file. And now she's got away with it, Watson. I deserve to be kicked from here to night. Holmes, Holmes. Now, listen to me. I, I was going through the file a few weeks ago, making some notes for my stories, and I remember coming across that slip of paper. I copied the figures down in my notebook. Bravo, Watson. I don't know what I'd ever do oh, without you. Oh, thanks so much. Just a minute, just a minute. Here they are. Ah, here we are. Here are the figures. T2N302S50. What the deuce does it mean, Holmes? I don't know, but I think I may have a glimmering. Get your coat and hat, old chap. The game's afoot. Where are we going? To Scotland Yard. And then I hope we'll be on the track of the Shrewsbury Emeralds. <laughs> I say, Holmes, if you don't want to talk, you might at least tell me why we're driving about in this dreary part of London. I don't care for it at all, especially at dusk. Sorry, Watson, I was thinking. Inspector Lestrade has just informed me that he's unearthed a new clue in the case. Oh? It seems that when Ruffy was hiding from the police, he worked for a time in this neighborhood. Oh, where? At a place known as Gaunt's Castle. It's somewhere here off the Mile End Road. Apparently, it's a sort of museum run by a certain eccentric man named Jezra Gaunt. Its main claim to distinction is that it contains a catacomb, or to be precise, several catacombs. Extraordinary thing. An ideal place to hide stolen jewels, I'd say. Catacombs? Here in London? Impossible. Not at all, Watson. But I thought they were vast underground tombs only found in Italy. Now, these are reputed to be reproductions of the early catacombs of Rome. Good gracious me. Apparently, Mr. Gaunt found these deep underground caverns some years ago. And their natural contours made it possible for him to convert them into a modern counterpart of the Italian ones. All right, cabby. This is the place. Righto, Governor. There you are. Keep the change. Thank you, Governor. Come on. Get up. So this is Gaunt's Castle. A frightening-looking place. Like a prison. It's getting dark. Why can't we come back in the morning, Holmes? I think there's somebody watching us through the peephole in the door. Yes, there would be. Uh-huh. He's opening it. Good evening, gentlemen. You're late. I was just locking my museum up for the night. You're Mr. Jezra Gaunt? Yes, sir. At your service. My name is Sherlock Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do, Mr. Gaunt? Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson? Well, this is a great honor. Uh, please step inside, gentlemen. I'll, uh, I'll turn the gas up. There. I uh, hope you'll find the castle, as I call it, interesting. Mr. Gaunt, time is vitally important. Some three years ago, you had a man working for you as a laborer. 
His name was Routier. Uh, I can't recall any man of that name, Mr. Holmes. He was a Frenchman, Mr. Gaunt. Does that mean anything to you? Oh, I'm sorry, but in this part of London, there are many foreigners, and many of them have worked for me. But, uh... This man, Routier, was a jewel thief. He is known to have hidden some very valuable emeralds, and it seems quite possible he may have hidden them here. Dear me, stolen drills in my catacombs, Mr. Holmes? Oh, no, I... I want you to give us your permission to deduct a detailed examination of your caves and to take some measurements. Oh, yes, of course. What an extraordinary coincidence. Coincidence? Yes. A man and a woman were here a little while ago. I didn't pay much attention to them as they entered, but I happened to observe them later in the catacombs. They were taking measurements. By Joe Holmes. Go on, Mr. Gaunt. When they saw I was watching them, they were very evasive and left after a few moments. Until you mentioned taking measurements, the whole incident seemed unimportant. It was far from unimportant, Mr. Gaunt. They are desperate. We must work fast. May we start our search at once? Well, of course, of course. Uh, I'll go and light the gas. Extraordinary Holmes, Mrs. Frampton, that accomplice who attacked me must have come here straight from Baker Street. Yes, and they'll be back. Probably tonight. It's a race against time. Well, so far they apparently haven't succeeded in deciphering the code. And neither have we. Watson, it's a battle of wits. Oh, really? They won the first round. Let's hope we can win the second. Well, Dr. Watson, how did you and the great Sherlock Holmes make out when you explored the underground caves? For that first hour, we searched that strange place exhaustively without finding a clue. Then I remember we descended into one of the deepest and darkest caves. Must have been a weird picture as we stood there, our voices echoing hollowly. A vast black chasm yawning in front of us and a feeble flicker of gaslight throwing a pool of light on the piece of paper which Holmes held in his Watson, I'm certain the figures on this paper are the clue to the missing emeralds. But why can't I get the code? T2, N3, O2, S5, O. They might be pacing directions. Obviously, but beginning where? I don't know, but 2N could be two places north. Still, how about T and, uh, and O? The T being the first letter is presumably the starting point. But what does it stand for? But, of course, here's the answer. Look here on the wall. You mean that colored tablet? Yes. It's a common early Christian symbol known, known as St. Antony's Cross. And it's also the Greek letter T. This is our starting point. T is the first letter in this code. And then comes 2N. Let's try it. Two paces north. So. Then comes the letter O. Oh, uh, oh it, could, uh, it could mean zero. Yes, it could, old chap, or it might be... No, no, I have it. Remember that Routhier was a Frenchman. What's that got to do with it? The French word for West is West, spelled O-U-E-S-T. French compasses have an O where ours have the W. Two paces north, three O, three paces west. See if Gaunt will lend, lend us a spade, Watson, dear chap, will you? We're getting warm, we're getting decidedly warm. Holmes, I, I think we've drawn a blank. So do I. Yet the code is a logical one. Two paces north, three west, two south, five wait. Wait a minute. Paces are inaccurate, Watson. They vary. A man would surely leave his records in carefully measured feet. Here's a tape measure. Why don't you try measuring it out in feet? Thanks. Now, two feet north, three west, two south, and five west would be here. Give me the spade, Watson. I'll do the digging this time. Oh, thanks very much. Holmes, if you dig any deeper, you'll come out in Australia. <sighs> and yet I know we're basically on the right track. What an unmitigated idiot I am. Watson, look on the other side of this tape measure. What's on it? It's marked in meters. Rothier was French. Now we have the answer, Watson. Two meters north, three west, two south, and five west. Give him the spade again. Yeah. If I'm wrong this time, I'll retire from my profession. 
What's that? It's a metal box. Watson, unless I'm very much mistaken, we've found the Shrewsbury Emerald. Great Scott! box is a little tarnished, a little rusty, but its contents are undamaged. Look at these emeralds, Watson. Aren't they exquisite? In this gaslight, they look just like liquid jade. Quite a poet, aren't you, Dr. Watson? Oh, hello, Mr. Gold. You quite startled me. We've uh, we've found the treasure. Oh, I'm so glad, gentlemen. You've done the hard work for us. Look out, Watson. It's a trap. Come back here, Holmes. <laughs> Drop that revolver gun. I missed your friend, Dr. Watson, but I won't miss you. Stand where you are. In any case, Mr. Holmes can't get away. Fortunately for us, he's run into a cave from which there is no exit. Gertrude, Alfie. Here we are. Did you find it, Jesuit? Yes, my dear. Clever of them, wasn't it? I doubt whether we could have solved the code without their help. You scoundrels, I wish I'd get my hands on you. I'd... Dr. Watson, surely you're in no position to threaten. The three of us are armed, and your friend can't help you. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, come out of that cave with your hands up. We've won the final round. Not while I have the emeralds, you haven't. All round him out of there, blast him. It seems to me, Dr. Watson, that Mr. Holmes is being unusually stupid today. Be careful, Holmes. <laughs> what have you got me? Holmes! Holmes! Dear me, I'm afraid your friend's been injured, Doctor. For heaven's sake, let me go to him. I'm a doctor. I'm afraid I can't trust you. However, I'll tell Alfie to drag his body out here. Alfie! Never m- m- mind about Alfie. I just conked con- him one up before I shot Mr. Holmes. That voice... It's stuttering Steve Hacker. But it can't be. Steve Hacker's dead. That's what you th- think. But but he ain't dead. I bribed the prison doctor and his kite. Remember, I'm in the d- d- dark. You can't see me, but but I can see you. You're standing in the light. So you'd better, better do like I say. Dr. Watson. Yes, Hacker. What, what is it? I, I, I remember you. You ain't a bad sort of a text assistant. I trust you more than these rats. If you don't want me to shoot, you'd better drop your re- re- revolvers at Dr. Watson's feet. I'll trust him. Go on, d- drop them. You better do as he says. I think he means business. All right, Hacker. Here. Now yours, did you, Gertrude. There. Pick him up, Dr. W- Watson. I've got him. Splendid, Holmes. Then hand me one. But Holmes, wh- where's Steve Hacker? Aside from the fact that he's dead, I have no idea, old chap. I took the liberty of impersonating him, or rather his ghost, temporarily. You shot Alfie? Certainly. He was about to shoot me. But he is not quite dead, unfortunately. And now, Watson, old chap, I think it's about time we turn this unsavory little gathering over to the police. Watson, it's rather pleasant to be back in Baker Street. It's been a tiring day. You know, Holmes, the way you imitated stuttering Steve Hacker was, was amazing. Well, thanks awfully, old chap. Oh, not at all. You, you had them completely fooled. Of course, I saw, saw the whole thing immediately. Oh, of course. You're very clever, though. You shot Alfie and then faked your own wounded groans. Yes. Amazing, whatever. It was remarkably effective. <laughs> and Alfie's subsequent confession confirmed my suspicions. Hacker, ill and afraid of dying, talked with Alfie during his recent stay in Dartmoor and told him to find the booty and share it with Hacker's wife. But Alfie, as soon as he was released from prison and thinking Hacker dead, decided to get it all for himself and his accomplices. As pretty a tangle of criminality as I ever ran into. Perhaps your return to practice won't be as dull as you think. Come in. Excuse me, Mr. Holmes, but about the dog. Dog? What dog? The nice wee fella the lady brought this afternoon. He's still downstairs. I gave him a bath and a nice big beef bone. Now, what do you want me to do with him? Hmm. An intriguing problem. Let me see now. He's been cooped up a long time. Oh, here it comes. I think it would be an excellent idea if Dr. Watson took him for a nice walk. Uh, a nice walk? But, uh, Holmes, uh, I'm very tired. I don't want oh, to come, Watson. Walk. Remember, he's quite a remarkable animal. Remarkable. He wrote a letter. Take him for a walk. He convinced you that he was royalty and then undoubtedly saved your life. I think you owe him a little consideration, don't you? Well, of course, if you put it that way, I suppose we've got it. And that's how you acquired this little dog, Collery, Dr. That's right, Mr. Bell. I had that wretched little animal on my hands till it died of old age. (laughs) I got quite fond of it, as a matter of fact. (laughs) (laughs) I see. 
And what story are you going to tell us next week, Dr. Watson? Well, now, next week, I think I'll tell you a story I call The Adventure of Black Angus. I always think it was one of the most gruesome and macabre experiences that Sherlock Holmes and I ever encountered. (laughs) ¶¶